It is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for this evening, Dr. Richard Klein. Um, I, I'm very pleased that he and his wife were willing to drive down from Stanford today. It's, it's very rare that we have scholars of his caliber that come and speak to us at Cal Poly. Um, Dr. Klein has one of the most impressive academic vitas that I've ever seen in my life. He has published no fewer than nine books on a variety of topics on human biology and evolution, including this text. This is the third edition of The Human Career, which in my opinion is the most detailed, complete, authoritative uh, text available on the topic of human biology and evolution. He's also published over 150 scholarly articles on topics of evolution uh, and archaeology, world prehistory in the world's leading uh, scholarly journals. He's published in uh, a number of articles in science. He is also the editor of the Journal of Archaeological Sciences. He is currently a professor of biology and anthropology at Stanford. And I think with, with I, I could go on and on and on about his achievements, but let me say that I, I feel that he is perhaps uh, the single most accomplished anthropologist that we've ever had speak at Cal Poly. So with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Klein to the podium. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Jones for that wonderful uh, introduction, and I appreciate everybody coming to hear what I have to say tonight. Um, Actually, I can maybe say a, a word or two about the other talks that are coming up in this series. Hopefully, I, I won't extend much beyond my second hour. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the origins of modern humans, people who act, behave, and look just like we do. And the bottom line is that people like this have existed for only perhaps 50,000 years. And they expanded from Africa to other parts of the world, beginning about 50,000 years ago. And I'll talk about that now. The chart that's up here on the board at the moment, on the screen at the moment, is in a sense the entire scheme of human evolution. Uh, we define humanity, broadly speaking, by the acquisition of two-legged bipedal locomotion. When we see as something that looks ape-like but is walking around habitually on two legs, we start calling it human. The oldest actual indisputable evidence for bipedalism, for two-legged locomotion, routine, regular walking around, running around on two legs, is here at about 4.1 million years. See, that's where the arrow shows. Uh, there are older fossils going back to about 6 or 7 million years that make it may, in fact, be bipedal, come from bipedal creatures. Tim White is coming to talk to you about this one right here, Artipithecus ramidus, which uh, you'll find when he comes to talk to you. It's a very, very, it's a fascinating creature. They have a complete skeleton. And there's some debate about the extent to which it was bipedal. And, of course, he will address that. Uh, when Henry Gilbert comes in a, a few weeks or a few couple months, I guess, he's going to be talking about the sort of middle segment of human evolution in here, uh, say between a million and a half a million years ago, maybe a little bit beyond a half a million years ago. And I'm going to be talking, as Dr. Jones said, about the very end. In this middle segment here, you can see there's a species here called Homo ergaster. Some people call that Homo erectus or African Homo erectus. It appeared about two million years ago. It's the first uh, human species to have exited Africa, to have moved out of Africa. Everything else you see before this, all these other species you see on the chart here, uh, existed solely in Africa. The earliest bipeds were in Africa. Homo ergaster emerged at about two million years ago and then spread from Africa. And after it spread from Africa, of course, there were still people behind in Africa, left behind, and then there were people in Eurasia, Europe and Asia. And what seems to have happened then is that we get a, a, an evolutionary divergence. So the earliest branch to go off after Homo ergaster left Africa is in East Asia, what I call Homo erectus in the narrow sense here. In Africa and in Europe, there was a, a common species until about perhaps 600,000 years ago called Homo heidelbergensis, the descendant of Homo ergaster. And somewhere after 600, 700,000 years ago, it's split into two lines, one of which is the Neanderthals, which were an exclusively European line, and the other is us, an exclusively African line. 
So about 50,000 years ago, you have human populations on three different continents. You have the Neanderthals in Europe. You have modern humans, people who look and act like us, in Africa. And in the Far East, you have or Eastern Asia, you have Homo erectus. Now, obviously, only we survive today. And one of the things I want to talk about, maybe the, you could say the main topic I want to address now, is why that is. You can't really tell on this chart, but uh, Homo neanderthalensis here, the Neanderthals actually terminates before zero. MA, incidentally, is millions of years ago. So this would be the zero point here. Only Homo sapiens obviously comes up to the zero point, comes up to the present. What happened to these other species? Well, in short, they were replaced by Homo sapiens expanding from Africa about 50,000 years ago and replaced largely without any kind of interbreeding, without any, out any kind of gene exchange. So let me expand on that a little bit here. Now, first of all, I, something I always think is important in talking about human evolution, and particularly the later parts of human evolution, is to explain how we know the differences between various kinds of people. How do we know whether someone's a modern human in anatomy or a non-modern human? We rely very heavily on the skull for this, and I thought just to demonstrate to you that this can be done, if, at least if the bones or skulls are complete enough. Here over on your, your left is the skull of a early modern human, so-called so Cro-Magnon. This, in fact, is one of the specimens from the site of Cro-Magnon in France, Cro-Magnon I. And over on the, the right, you have a Neanderthal. The Cro-Magnon dates to about 30 to 35,000 years ago. The Neanderthal is roughly twice that age, 70,000 years ago. And just looking at them, I think impressionistically, you can see that they're very different. The skulls are very different. Modern human skulls, like the one that is illustrated here on the left, this Cro-Magnon, are relatively high if you make a measurement from the ear aperture to the top of the skull, and relatively short if you measure from between the eyes to the back. Neanderthals, on the other hand, have much longer skulls, and relatively speaking, they're much slower. You can also see that the modern human face, and you can see this, you don't need my slide for this, you can see this just by looking in a mirror or looking at your neighbor, the, the modern human face is tucked in underneath the fore part of the brain, which would be right about there. The Neanderthal face is out in front of the fore part of the brain and, in fact, joined to the rest of the skull by a brow ridge, which in, is in front of the fore part of the brain. Very often, Neanderthals lack chins. Most often, they lack chins. Modern humans have them. There are lots of differences, and if the skulls don't even really have to be quite as complete as these, if they're complete enough, not difficult to tell when you have a Neanderthal or a modern human or a member of that other species that I call Homo erectus. Now, we have a variety of evidence that indicates that modern humans, like the person that I had on the screen a moment ago on the left, that Cro-Magnon person, originated in Africa beginning about 50,000 years ago. And I'm going to use the abbreviation KA for, for thousands of years ago. When modern humans emerged from Africa at about 50,000 years ago, the only people who were living in Europe were the Neanderthals, and then in East Asia there were other kinds of people, Homo erectus. So I'm going to focus on the Neanderthals in talking about the expansion of modern humans and how they managed to replace other kinds of people because we know the Neanderthals so well, and we don't know Homo erectus in East Asia anywhere near as well. All right. So what you have is a, it's an interesting event, uh, maybe the most interesting event that paleoanthropologists will ever discover other than perhaps the initial uh, stages of bipedalism at six or seven million years ago. This very rapid expansion out of Africa 50,000 years ago by modern humans replace non-modern humans in Eurasia. Now, the evidence that we have comes in two parts, as it says at the top here. There are fossils, and you're looking at one here, and there are genes. And I don't have much time to talk about either of the fossils or the genes. I re rather, I, what I want to do actually is talking about, talk about the archaeology, which I think helps us understand how modern humans were able to replace non-modern humans in Eurasia, not how modern Africans were able to spread at the expense of non-modern Eurasians. But I do want to give you a little bit of a taste for what the evidence is for the evolution of modern humans in Africa while other kinds of people were living in Eurasia. This is a skull you're looking at here from the side and from the front that came from a place called Herto in Ethiopia. It's dated to about 160,000 years. In fact, it actually may be a bit younger than that, but roughly 160,000 years ago. And you can see it's a big, robust skull. It's got a big brow ridge on it. Now, some modern people, including me, have pretty good-sized brow ridges. That in and of itself is not a, a particularly diagnostic feature. In terms of the shape of the skull, though, it's relatively uh, short from fore to back and relatively high. And in that sense, it looks like that Cro-Magnon skull. It's a robust version of that Cro-Magnon skull. And you can see the face here, 
is tucked in underneath the fore part of the brain. A lot of forehead and whatever. We don't have the lower jaw, but presumably it would have had a chin. So this is a, a modern human, in anatomical terms anyway, living in Africa below the Sahara in Ethiopia 160,000 years ago. Now I show you this particular specimen because it's particularly well preserved and complete. But we have lots of others from Africa dating from as far back as 250,000 years ago. Lots of other fossils that indicate that while the Neanderthals were the sole occupants of Europe, and we have these other people, Homo erectus in the Far East, only modern people were living in Africa, or the ancestors, you might say, of modern people. So we have these different evolutionary lines. Modern people were evolving in Africa while the Neanderthals and Homo erectus were living in Eurasia. The genes are interesting. Uh, in fact, to me, they're fascinating. The idea that we can get genes out of Neanderthal bones or the bones of other fossil people is something I wouldn't have believed when I got into this business. I won't tell you when, but a while ago. It's been possible for roughly the last 15 years. And this is a tree here that shows you the distinctiveness of the Neanderthals. This is based on one kind of DNA, which is called mitochondrial DNA, which I'm sure you encounter in your coursework. But anyway, this is a tree of resemblance. It shows that the Neanderthals are off here way on their own branch. Here are all modern humans in here on these other branches, more closely linked to each other than they are to the Neanderthal. So the Neanderthal branch is distinctive, and again, just as they're distinctive in their morphology and their anatomy, they're distinctive in their genes. Something else that this tree shows, which is interesting, if you look at the, these are all the modern humans that were used to make a comparison to the Neanderthal. Up here you have a mix of Africans and non-Africans, and down here you have Africans on yet separate branches. What this is telling us is that Africans are actually among living humans, the most genetically diverse. Eurasians are a kind of subset of Africans from a genetic point of view. Africans are more diverse. Why would that be? Well, the answer is simple, actually. We originated in Africa, everybody alive today. Africa is the place where modern humans have lived longest. It's the place where genetic variability has had the longest time to accumulate. So the genetics of living people also tells us that Africa is the place where we originated simply because Africans, there's lots more evidence than this, but simply because Africans are genetically so much more diverse than everybody else, where anybody who comes from Eurasia will be a kind of a, a subset of African, will represent a subset of African genetic variability. Okay, now this gets to what I really want to talk to you about tonight. It's just something that's fascinated me for years. I, I am a kind of an archaeologist more than I am a, a fossil person. And one thing that I think is, is striking is that before 50 or 60,000 years ago, we had these anatomically modern humans, people who looked like that Herto person, in Africa, but they were confined to Africa. They didn't expand from Africa. And then suddenly, at about 50,000 years ago, they expanded, and they expanded very rapidly, you know, almost instantaneously from a geologic perspective. So what happened? Well, we know at one level what happened. Behavior changed in Africa 50,000 years ago, and it's the behavioral change which prompted the spread out of Africa to Eurasia. When you look before 50,000 years ago, it doesn't really matter what continent you're looking at. 100,000 years ago, if you're looking at the archaeology of Africa or the archaeology of, of Europe or Asia, it's all roughly the same thing. And this is what this slide is meant to illustrate. But before 50,000 years ago, no matter where you were, people manufactured a relatively small range of artifact types. I wish I could expand on that. Maybe if there's a question or two, I can. But compared to what happened after 50,000 years ago, the number of different kinds of artifacts we can detect before 50,000 years is relatively small. Before 50,000 years ago, people don't seem to have recognized plastic raw materials like bone or ivory or shell as material out of which you could make useful artifacts. Occasionally they used ivory or antler or shell, but it's rare. After 50,000 years ago, it becomes commonplace. Before 50,000 years ago, the artifact assemblages we have very put it the other way around. They don't vary over uh, short distances. They are remarkably homogeneous over huge areas. When I, I went to do my dissertation research in Russia on the Neanderthal artifact assemblages from Russia, I already studied ones in France as supposed to teach me how to look at them in Russia. In fact, it worked fine. The artifacts that Neanderthals made in, in France are more or less identical to the ones they made in Russia. And then I subsequently went to Southern Africa to do my research. And the artifacts that people were making there in the Neanderthal time range before 50,000 years ago look like Neanderthal artifacts too. And if we were just to decide who had lived in Southern Africa, say 75,000 years ago, based on the artifacts, we might say Neanderthals. But in fact, we know from the human remains that they weren't. 
So before 50,000 years ago, the artifacts are all very similar everywhere, and they are similar over vast distances, except for the kinds of raw materials, that is, the stone types, that I saw when I first went to southern Africa. I could have thought that the artifacts I was looking at, dating from 50, 75, 100,000 years ago, came from France or Russia. Something else that's interesting is that before 50,000 years ago, we don't have any evidence for structures, no indisputable runes, or any evidence that people spatially organize their sites. It's a peculiar thing because, you know, when you go out and you go camping, you know, you have, let's say you're doing some fishing. You clean the fish over here. If you're going to do some laundry, you do it over here. You do different things in different places, and that will be visible at your campsite if somebody came and excavated it shortly after. That kind of spatial organization of a campsite becomes apparent only after 50,000 years ago. Before that time, it doesn't matter where you put a hole in the site. You always get the same thing. It's really peculiar. People before 50,000 years ago definitely buried their dead. We know the Neanderthals buried their dead. But they did it with no ritual, no ceremony. The holes are usually just, or graves, if you use that term, are usually just big enough to take a body. As if they had a kind of hygienic problem. You know, somebody died on the surface of the cave. They want to stay there for a while. They dig a hole big enough to take the body and shove it in, cover it up, and they can, then they can carry on. After 50,000 years ago, we get much more complex graves with grave goods, all kinds of indications that people were worried about the, you know, what was going to happen to the buried, to the dead person. Before 50,000 years ago, people rarely have ever produced art. And I both face this because I think this is a very important point. It's hard to imagine a human society, certainly there are none known historically or ethno-historically, that lacked art. And art is somehow to me the, you know, the, the best indication when you find it in the archaeological record that we're dealing with the modern human mind. So I want to talk a little bit more about art before I finish here and stress this as something that really is striking, a striking difference of the archaeological record before 50,000 and after 50,000. Almost no art that we can talk of in meaningful terms before 50, lots of it after 50. And then a final point is that before 50,000 years ago, people didn't fish. We have plenty of sites where they fish, where the fish were nearby on coasts, rivers, lakes, whatever. Rarely do they have fish bones in them. After 50,000 years ago, wherever there are sites in the proper position, they're full of fish bones. And also, before 50,000 years ago, people hunted relatively ineffectively. After 50,000 years ago, they became much more proficient at hunting. The fishing thing, you might say, well, why emphasize that so much? Well, if you're living on the coast, as so many people did, and you can add fish to your diet, there are going to be a lot more of you. And in a sense, that's what evolution's about. It's about increases in numbers, about increasing human fitness, the ability to survive and reproduce. So when you get into fishing, there are going to be more people. And fishing as such, the technology actually, didn't originate until about 50,000 years ago. Now, just about everything on here, I think reflects the fact that we're dealing with minds, human minds, whether we're in Africa or Europe or in Asia, before 50,000 years ago, that are quite different than our own or than those of the people who appeared in Africa at 50,000 years ago and then spread to the rest of the world. And I'll come back to that. So this business of art. Well, there's always a problem in talking about whether something's art or not. You perhaps know the judicial definition of art or how judges, courts talk about it. They know it when they see it. There's no written definition anywhere. Pornography, I'm sorry, did I say art? I meant to say pornography. Pornography is, you know, and I think you can say art more generally, is in the eye of the beholder, right? And what some people consider to be art, other people don't recognize it as all, at all. And that's always an issue when you're trying to talk about the oldest art, because what I might not think of as an art object, somebody else might. Let me just proceed on this. This is a, a supposed figurine from a site in Israel dated to about 250,000 years ago. It's a volcanic pebble on which there are definitely some, let me find the pointer here, yes, there are definitely some lines that have been cut with a stone tool. There's a line there that might set off a neck. There are a couple lines here that look like they might set off arms. This thing is tiny, incidentally. It's just a couple inches long. And this has been billed as the world's oldest figurine, 250,000 years, human figurine. Well, to me, it looks like a potato with some cut marks on it. We can argue about that. If you're the discoverer of this, then, of course, it's understandable you want it to be something much more than just a piece of rock that somebody, for whatever reason, made a couple cup marks in. I don't call to consider this art. Much more famous and maybe uh, less, somewhat less ambiguous, there's this piece of ironstone here from a place called Blumbo's Cave. It's red pigment, ochre, 
ironstone. It's naturally occurring ironstone. People living in southern Africa, uh, from as far back actually as we know them, collected naturally occurring pigment, mostly red but sometimes black. And we know that they used it for a variety of utilitarian purposes. Perhaps the most important thing is they scraped powder from it and they put the powder into vegetal mastic or glue, which they then used to stick stone bits onto wooden shafts. Now, sites that date between, say, 100,000 and 50,000 years ago in southern Africa, I've excavated in or with other people in several of these sites, there are tens of thousands of pieces of this naturally occurring pigment. It occurs naturally out in the environment, but it's been intentionally collected and brought back to the caves. And at Blumbo's cave, one of these fragments has what looks to be a frame. You see it here? And then a bunch of X's engraved in the frame. And this is now taken by many people to be the oldest example of abstract art, dated to about 75 to 77,000 years ago. Question, is it art? If you've got tens of thousands of these pieces of, of stone like this, and many others have scratch marks on them, people would have scratched the stone to test the quality of the powder they were going to use for the glue. Every once in a while, might you not get something like this? I always think of the, you know, the old business about if you got a, gave monkeys typewriters and a, you know, infinite amount of time, that eventually they'd produce Hamlet. Well, I think it's, that's what this is in, in an essence. If you realize just what a rare object this is among all the pieces of ironstone, this red pigment that, have been collect that were collected by people before 50,000 years ago, some of which do show marks, but none of them is patterned as this, I admit, maybe every once in a while you could expect to get something patterned. Also from this site, there are these things that are called beads, a tiny little shell about the size of your thumbnail, a tick shell, and you can see there are holes through these things. The holes are not... If they were made by artifacts, it's not obvious. They're through the thinnest part of the shell, and there's no indication that anybody applied a stone tool to them or whatever. Yet, you can see that there are plenty of them. There are some 50 from this side of Bumbo's cave, and they've been called bees. And the question is, are they bees? Well, maybe. To me, it would be more convincing if, they, if the shells themselves were modified in form in, to make bees. And I'll show you some true bees in a little bit. And uh, by the same token, I think you would agree with me, the object on the left that has those X marks on it, that would be a lot more convincing as a piece of art if the outline with the stone tool, and the stone tool that made those X marks, was of an animal or a person. Now, something else that happens with art that's older than 50,000 years ago is, whether, is knowing whether, in fact, it was excavated properly and whether, in fact, it actually is older than 50,000 years ago. These are pieces of ostrich egg shell here from Deep Kloof Rock Shelter in South Africa, and they're dated to 60,000 years, maybe even a little before. And they're definitely decorated. I don't know whether you can see the lines clearly here, but there's no question that's decoration. People made decoration, decorated ostrich egg shells. They're, these are, are big shells, 22 times the volume of a chicken shell and much thicker. And people in recent times, at the time of European contact, just a few hundred years ago, were decorating ostrich egg shells. They often made water containers out of them. They would put a hole, big hole and a smaller hole, so that when they drank out of the big hole, the smaller hole would let air in. They would take these things and bury them around the environment with water in them, plugged, and then in a time when they might not be able to find water otherwise, they'd remember where they'd left them, and then they would go and dig them up. Well, it, that's what I think happened at these poop rock shelters. On the very top of the deposit, I think, there were a bunch of these relatively recent burials of ostrich eggshell containers decorated, and when they were excavated, they were associated with much older artifacts, thought to be with much older artifacts. They've been dated to 60,000 years ago. Um, that's based on charcoal that occurs in the same deposit, radiocarbon date, um, about as old as radiocarbon can get. can get. My own feeling would be that it would be worthwhile to take one of these pieces of shell and date it directly, but I haven't been able to convince the excavators to do that. Anyway, this is definitely art, and the problem is how old is it? If you take the sum of what I'm saying, and I could give you lots of other examples, I just don't see any really good evidence for art in Africa or anywhere else before 50,000 years ago. Now, what about elsewhere? What about among the Neanderthals? Well, if you like art before 50,000 years ago, then they were doing it too. Although they would generally not be recognized as artistic by the people who were favoring that Southern African art. Here is a piece of schist on the site in Bulgaria that's got multiple marks on it. Art, I don't know. 
This is a, a, a fossil, a nummelite here from Hungary, on which somebody looks like they've engraved an X. There's some perforated shells here from a site in Spain, Cueva los, los Aviones. And then there's, from another Spanish site, there's a pectin shell, which has been pierced again, perforated, and it's got lots of, of coloring matter attached to it, as if maybe it was a palette, a paint palette or something of that sort. So if you like ambiguous art, like the pieces we were looking at from southern Africa a little while ago and the one from Israel before that, there's plenty of it in Europe, too. And it's ordinarily not recognized as such because it was produced by Neanderthals before 50,000 years ago, and everybody knows they weren't modern and weren't going to become modern, so we just neglect it. But the same kinds of things, when they're found in southern Africa, are taken as early indications of art. Now, when you get to more recent periods after 50,000 years ago, then art is everywhere. And these are the oldest, actually that's one there, of the oldest beads in the world that come from Nkapuni Yamuto in the central Rift Valley of Kenya. could be as old as 50,000, it's certainly 45,000 years old. There were 13 beads found in the deposit, and next to it are pieces of ostrich egg shell that were going to be made into beads. You make the hole first and then cut out around the hole. Now that's a preformed thing. I mean, that's something that was cut. This is, it's, got, it's a separate form. People were still making things like this historically. But that's not natural. There's no other explanation for that than that it was humanly made. And then we, in Europe, of course, we have these wonderful things. Here's a so-called Venus figurine from a site in Germany. It's probably, uh, it's older than 35,000 years. could be 40,000. And it's weird, obviously female, but with exaggerated female features. It's highly stylized, but everybody would recognize that as art, an intentionally modified piece of, of stone that we would call art. And then, of course, there's this wonderful cave art from Europe starting before 32,000 years ago. These are rhinos and other animals from Chauvet Cave in France. All right, so my point is that behavior changed radically about 50,000 years ago. It changed in Africa first, and then that promoted the out-of-Africa spread, and with that, the art and other things I'm going to talk about. I want to introduce a couple words here just to make sure that I uh, don't use them in, you know, without meaning to otherwise. 50,000 years ago is this change in Africa. It's also a change in the kinds of artifacts that people made. Before 50,000 years ago, they made Middle Stone Age artifacts. These are the kinds of pieces that if you put them in Europe, you'd think Neanderthals made them. And then after 50,000 years ago, they made later Stone Age artifacts. And they're quite different. Let me just illustrate that for you briefly. At the bottom here left, you have Middle Stone Age artifacts. And uh, top left, you have later Stone Age artifacts. Only the later Stone Age artifacts include pieces like these small things here. Find them. Notice how tiny they are. That we know historically were mounted as arrow points, were used as arrow points. Sometimes three are mounted in a glob of glue at the end of an arrow. These things down here, some of them were probably mounted, but they were mounted as spear points, thrusting spear points. Quite different. These were weapons that if you were to try and kill a buffalo or a zebra, you'd have to walk right up next to it, whereas, of course, with a bow and arrow, you could take a shot from a distance. And even if you weren't all that great a shot, you didn't expose yourself to so much risk. To take more shots, there probably would be more people as a result because your success rate would be higher. Also, after 50,000 years ago, we get these wonderful bone artifacts in, in later Stone Age assemblages. They also, of course, appear in Europe. We call them their Upper Paleolithic. And here you have a variety of them here. Some of them are probably projectile points. Bone projectile points are much better, actually, in many cases than stone projectile points because they're more aerodynamic and you can then fire them more accurately. These pieces that you're looking at over here, these bone pieces, every one of which is an artifact, some of them might be ornaments of some kind down here. There's nothing like this in a Middle Stone Age site. These are all things that appeared about 50,000 years ago. These things here, which I've called bone gorges, were probably like fish hooks. You could bait them, throw them out into the water, uh, and fish would swallow them. Actually, birds too, things like cormorants, and then you've caught them. Nothing like that in a Middle Stone Age site. Maybe that's the reason there are no fish and other animals that could be caught that way in those Stone Age sites. Okay. So, on, this, on the coast of South Africa where I work, we have a variety of sites that indicate that later Stone Age people after 50,000 years ago hunted and gathered much more effectively than the people who lived there before them, their Middle Stone Age predecessors. Later Stone Age abbreviated LSA, Middle Stone Age MSA. So just some of the differences between later Stone Age and Middle Stone Age sites. In the later Stone Age sites, you get a lot more in the way of airborne birds. This is, these are coasts that have penguins. So 
we have another kind of bird to compare to cormorants and gulls and things of that sort. Middle Stone Age sites have lots of penguins. Later Stone Age sites have penguins too, but they add to that flying birds, flying seabirds. And that's understandable if, in fact, the bone projectile points that I was just showing you, which we know were used historically to catch flying birds, to shoot down flying birds, were, in fact, invented about 50,000 years ago, weren't there before that. The sites that date before 50,000 years are much uh, poorer in what we might consider to be the most dangerous available prey, wild pigs and buffalo, and much more, much richer in more docile prey, eland, other things like that. I can't get into this in detail, but I think that what this represents, the reason the more dangerous animals become more common after 50,000 years ago is because people now have much more effective weaponry for hunting, particularly weaponry that reduces their own risk when they go hunting. Something else that's very interesting, at, at 50,000 years ago, we get a change in what seems to be the, the pattern, the seasonal pattern in which people occupy the coast. Seal bones, there's the first seal here, and without getting into it again in detail, the ages of the animals at time of death can tell you the time of the year when people were occupying the site. In Middle Stone Age sites, they seem to have been there all year based on the ages of the seal, the first seals. In later Stone Age sites, they came at a time of the year when first seals would have, in fact, been easiest to catch. It's very obvious from the ages of the first seals. Now maybe they could make the, maybe the difference is that the later Stone Age people had water containers and so they could move around the environment, whereas the Middle Stone Age people before 50,000 years, years ago were more confined to the, the coast, in particular the places where rivers ran into the coast because they needed to be near water all the time. Something I've already said is that sites before 50,000 years ago contained relatively few fish bones and they also lack the technology that you need for fishing. And this is not just those double-pointed things that I showed you before, those fish gorges. But in sites that are younger than 50,000 years ago, we also find net sinkers and other indications of, of fishing technology. And then finally, something that's very interesting to me, uh, we were always, of course, interested in knowing what population size was like in the past. And did population grow through time? Did it fluctuate through time? And sites that are younger than 50,000 years ago, these um, later Stone Age sites, or I should turn it around and talk about it the other way, sites that are older than 50,000 years ago, Middle Stone Age sites, contain much larger shellfish and much larger tortoises. The, the remains are, come from much larger animals than sites that are younger than 50,000 years, than later Stone Age sites. Why would the Middle Stone Age sites have such big shellfish and such big tortoises? Well, the best explanation I can think of is that Middle Stone Age people were not as thick on the ground. There were fewer of them. So when you're dealing with shellfish or tortoises, these are not dangerous creatures. They don't require any special risk when you go out to hunt them. You can call it even hunting. And, of course, uh, they don't require any special technology. So if you, you know, you're you sitting in your site, you're going to go out, it's, you know, it's Sunday noon and you're having brunch and you've invited a bunch of friends, you go out to look for tortoises and shellfish, which ones are you going to pick up first? The biggest one. Why are you going to pick up the biggest ones? Well, because they're the most obvious and also because they have the most flesh, most return for effort. If now more people start doing that, start picking them up, what's going to happen to the average size of these animals? It's going to get smaller. And after 50,000 years ago, they're much smaller, suggesting that after 50,000 years ago, human populations had increased substantially. Again, human fitness, the ability to survive and reproduce, changed dramatically 50,000 years ago. Bigger populations, therefore, smaller tortoises and shellfish. I just thought I'd take a moment, I, let's see, I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome here, but I thought I'd take a moment to show you pictures of some of the South African sites that provided evidence both for the art, or non-art, as I think of it, and for the changes in hunting and gathering. This is the part of South Africa that I've worked in mostly. It's this rectangle here around Cape Town. Some of you may have gone to Cape Town. There it is there. If you have, you know what a beautiful place, part of the world this is. We have lots of coastal sites, both middle and later Stone Age sites are indicated on here. There are two coasts actually to consider. There's the west coast or the Atlantic coast, which is very cold, more or less like the coast of California with kelp beds and all that kind of thing. And then there's the south coast, which is much warmer, more like our Hawaiian coast. It's the Indian Ocean coast. And so when you see changes <coughs> between the middle Stone Age and later Stone Age on these two coasts, and the coasts themselves are very different, you get the thinking, well, culture, the change in culture is why you have these differences can't have to do with environment. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are a couple of very important sites that have provided evidence on the, on the hunting and the gathering. Also very important human fossils from before 50,000 years ago. 
They're at a place called Classy River Mouth, or Classy River, about 700 kilometers east of Cape Town. Two caves, one on top of another, KRM-1, KRM-2. See the Indian Ocean out here? Bloomboat's Cave, which is much closer to Cape Town, 275 kilometers east of Cape Town. This is the place that provided that piece of ironstone or ochre or pigment with the X's, and also the, the shell beads, both shell beads, at 75,000 years. <coughs> De Kelder's Cave, which is yet a little closer to Cape Town. Uh, and again, and you may have noticed in the last slide, I indicated the bottom of the later Stone Age, the top of the Middle Stone Age. Another one of these coastal caves, very informative about changes in the way people were making a living between the Middle Stone Age and the later Stone Age. This is a site that I've been excavating most recently. It's on the, the, the three that we're just looking at are on the south coast, the Indian Ocean coast. Here's one on the Atlantic coast, north of Cape Town, called Easterfontaine One. And it's a collapsed rock shelter. We found it because they were, you see here there's a, a village back there, a town. It's actually a summer resort community. You see a road coming down to the parking lot. And that road was pretty awful for a long while, and the local fishermen were complaining, so they decided to widen the road and pave it. And in the process, they cut back into the hillside, and there was a collapsed cave. I was driving by there one day, and there were shells and bones and stones uh, washing out. I thought, well, this is interesting. We dug there. And it's a typical Middle Stone Age site. Right on the water, but no, shell, no fish. A lot of other things that are different from what you find in a later Stone Age site. No, no bone artifacts, all that kind of thing. And finally, Deep Kloof Rock Shelter. This is the place that provided those pieces of ostrich egg shell that are supposed to be 60,000 years old and decorated, and I think are much younger. Spectacular site. Now, just let me give you an indication of what's involved in the size differences between the Middle and the Later Stone Age when you're dealing with tortoises. It's actually harder to show it with the tortoise. Here's the, the principal tortoise. Tortoises are very common in South Africa, and there's one that's particularly common in the area around Cape Town called the angulate tortoise. And this is its upper arm bone or, or humerus. And I measure this end, the elbow end, to get an idea of size. I wish I could measure the total length because it would be a, a, a better dimension. It's a longer dimension, less play when you, when you move the calipers and so forth. But often they're broken in half. Anyway, the point here is the Middle Stone Age ones, as you move over to the left, on average are bigger than the later Stone Age ones. I'll, I'll, I could deal a little bit with the details, but I think that probably see it well enough. It's easier to see it actually with the shellfish. This is a, a thing called the Cape Turban shell, which uh, occurs in sites on the south coast. Later Stone Age ones at the top here, Middle Stone Age ones at the bottom. The Middle Stone Age ones are uniformly larger than the Later Stone Age ones. And something I, I thought might interest you, here's the Bloom ones from Bloombo's Cave. Now this is the place that provided those uh, tick shell beads and the piece of ironstone with the maybe abstract art on it. Well, if those things are art and they indicate something about a change in human behavior that's very important, whatever that change in behavior was, it didn't increase human numbers. At least if you think that large shell size means not very many people. And here are some later Middle Stone Age samples. They're the same size as the ones from Blumbo's Cave, the shells are. No indication that whatever was happening at Blumbo's Cave that people were uh, increasing their fitness, their ability to survive and reproduce as a result. Okay. So this ability to survive and reproduce increased dramatically after Bloombo's Cave, about fifty to 45,000 years ago. And it's what precipitated the out of Africa expansion, the expansion of modern humans to the rest of the world, where they replaced non-modern humans. In fact, of course, perhaps the best evidence for increased ability to survive and reproduce is the expansion itself. Now there are two major alternative explanations for this behavioral change and with it for the enhanced survival and reproduction of human populations. I think the most popular one is that there was population growth in Africa between 150 and 50,000 years ago. Populations were growing, growing, growing. And about 50,000 years ago, they crossed some kind of threshold. And then people had to reorganize themselves socially, economically, in order to continue to maintain social integrity. And it's actually been suggested that this social reorganization involved the first development of a nuclear family, you know, one pair bond between one man, one woman, and then they cooperate economically to bring up the kids. So you get a division of labor by age, sex and age. This has been suggested as something that only appeared 50,000 years ago. It's certainly a much more uh, effective way to exploit the environment if you have men and women cooperating 
in, in, the, in the food quest and cooperate and bring up the kids. You could imagine that would allow greater human survival. But I don't think that this is something that dates to only 50,000 years ago. I would bet anything that this division of labor by sex in the nuclear family has much greater antiquity than that. And I don't see any reason why it would have originated just 50,000 years ago. If you look at population evidence, as we have it, in fact, populations at about 60,000 years ago crashed in Africa, or much of Africa. We have a very difficult time in southern Africa finding archaeological sites between 60 and 30,000 years ago. The reason is that it got very dry. And with this increased aridity, animal and plant populations collapsed, and of course, then human populations followed. Basically, there is no evidence for population growth in Africa before 50,000 years ago. All the population growth comes afterwards. So I don't see this as a particularly useful explanation. What, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative which I like, and unfortunately most of my colleagues do not, is that around 50, 60, 70,000 years ago, there was a biological change in Africa, a genetic change, that promoted the fully modern human brain, you know, produced the wet hardware that allows us to run this vast variety of software programs we call cultures today. And it was armed with that, and of course also the innovative ability and invention of all kinds of new implements, the art and all the rest of it, that allowed fully modern humans to expand at the expense of the Neanderthals and others. One of the things that's very interesting to me about this expansion, I'm arguing here, of course, for a genetic difference, a major genetic difference between expanding modern Africans and the Eurasians, including the Neanderthals they encountered, is how little evidence there is for any kind of exchange of either genes or culture during the African expansion into Eurasia. You perhaps read that just last year, someone estimated that perhaps 2.5% of the modern human genome came from Neanderthals. Well, I want to, I'll bet that doesn't hold up. And the argument that behind that is pretty weak, I think. And even at 2.5%, that's not a whole lot. We have no evidence for cultural exchange either. This expansion occurred rapidly, and it led to the extinction, essentially, of the Neanderthals and Homo erectus, something that we don't have evidence for in historic times. I mean, when Europeans expanded during the age of discovery to the Americas, to Africa, Australia, and so forth, they interbred rampantly with the people they found, and they exchanged culture. And if you want to demonstrate this in the area where I work in southern Africa, you drive around in the, in the summer rainfall zone, and what's the, what's the major crop? Maize. Where did that come from? So it's a very different kind of expansion at 50,000 years ago than the historic expansions that we're aware of, in that it doesn't seem to involve much in the way of interchange between the expanding population and the population that it encountered. To me, that suggests that there was a, some kind of a behavioral gulf. One side wasn't particularly interested, and that might be because the other side couldn't learn to do the things that made the one side, the expanding side, fully modern. Now, you might say, how would we ever get at this? I mean, is, is this a, just an idea, or is it a testable hypothesis that there was a genetic mutation 60, or 50, 000, 60 to 50,000 years ago? Well, I've already talked a little bit about Neanderthal genes. We now have the Neanderthal genome, or a rough draft of it. It's going to get, the draft is going to get much less rough as we go on, and there'll be replica, replica, replicated drafts from other Neanderthals. Some of the genes which Neanderthals had, I'll put it the other way around, some of the genes we have that are derived in, and that bear on cognition and communication were not present in the Neanderthals. Now, I'm not going to argue that any of those genes in particular made the Neanderthals dumber than we are. But there is plenty of evidence already from the Neanderthal genome that they were walking around with genes, genes that bear on cognition and communication that are different than the ones we have. And then the next trick is to find out exactly how those genes function and then to date them, to determine when they were selected for and if they were swept to fixation rapidly around 60,000 years ago, which is what I predict. So this is a testable hypothesis, this genetic thing. It's just going to take a little while as we accumulate more and more ancient DNA evidence. Okay, I hope I haven't clouded your minds. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions, if there are any.